Museum Club of Denver is um, it's one of nearly 300 alumni clubs around the world. And technically, they're not even called alumni clubs because they're open to everyone. Um, in Denver, we have events that we have community service, continuing education, spirituality, scholarship activities, and we have close to 4,000 alumni who live in our metro area. Um, these, the club hosts one or two of these lectures each year. They're always free, they're always open to the public, so we hope that you enjoy it tonight and come back to a future lecture. Um, and again, we only can do a program like this with the help of our partner, Regis University and Sister Peggy, so we are really, really fortunate to be able to work with them and be here. So thank you again, Sister Peggy. Um, so tonight, Professor Reynolds will speak and then take some questions, and afterward, we'll have some refreshments out in the lobby, and we'd encourage you to stay and talk, and if you have additional questions, um, hopefully he can stay around for just a few minutes and answer those. So, um, so Professor Gabriel Reynolds is here. He is a professor of Islamic Studies and Theology at the University of Notre Dame. His research focuses on the Quran and Muslim-Christian relations. He's the author of three books and nearly 20 articles, an editor or co-editor of three additional books. If you want more information on these, if you go to nd.edu and search on his name, his website pages will come up and you can see the full detailed list and how to access some of those things. At Notre Dame, he's organized two international conferences on the Quran. He's conducted research. <laughs> and delivered lectures in cities throughout the Middle East, and he spent last academic year as a research fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Mont France as the recipient. Um, he was the recipient of a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship. And in February, he was one of 15 Catholic delegates invited by the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue to participate in a bilateral conversation with 15 Muslim counterparts at Al Azhar Al Sharif Center for Dialogue in Cairo. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Columbia University and Master of Philosophy and PhD degrees from Yale. And at least at the website, it says in his spare time he follows Notre Dame football, plays soccer, and watches scientific, science fiction movies. So with that, Professor Reynolds, thank you. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Thank you very much for coming. Allow me to thank all of the members of the Notre Dame Alumni Club of Denver and especially to Amy Bennett for that generous introduction, and also Jennifer Hilger, who's helped organize this, and everyone else who's been a part of this organization. Also to Regis University and to Sister Peg for hosting me. I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes, but it's gonna feel like nothing. It's just gonna go by like that. So um, don't be uh, distraught that I said 45 minutes. The main topic tonight is the Quran and the Bible. It's meant as just a general introduction to both scriptures, but also we're gonna start with the larger topic of revelation. That's gonna be an important uh, word in tonight's talk. Revelation, of course, is the things that we know because God has told us or shown us them, things we wouldn't know otherwise, or things we might have known otherwise, but God wants to remind us of them. So both Islam and Christianity have notions of revelation. So it's going to be a general introduction to these concepts. I'm not going to, uh, as you, you might have gathered already from the introduction, I'm a Catholic. I'm not particularly going to speak from a Catholic perspective, but I hope to give just a basic introduction to both scriptures and the position of those scriptures in both faiths. Does that sound okay? We yeah. start that way? Okay. Thank you. So let's begin with theology. I don't know if we're going to be able to see the screens. What I'm going to speak about first is the theological relationship of Islam and Christianity, and then the literary relationship of the Quran and the Bible. And then I'll speak a little bit at the very end of how we can think of how these two scriptures can go together. We're going to start then with Christian revelation. From a Christian perspective, revelation takes place not only through the Bible, and that's an important point to make, that we think of revelation, what is God's word? We think of God's word principally as the scripture, right? 
But the idea in Christianity, and as we're about to find out in Islam also, is that God's revelation is more capacious or is broader than that. God's revelation, from a Christian perspective, begins and is, first of all, through the act of creation itself. So God's creation is a self-unfolding of His very nature. In the book of Romans from the New Testament, St. Paul explains that God can be known, indeed should be known, from nature. He writes, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, His invisible nature, namely His eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that He has made. So this means, in other words, from Paul's perspective in Romans, that simply by observing the natural world, the intellect, unaided by any special revelation, or inspiration should be able to come to the knowledge that God exists. And this, in fact, as we're about to see, is Catholic teaching. The Catholic Church in De Verbum, which is the document on revelation published at the Second Vatican Council, describes natural revelation as part of the divine world, uh, the divine plan, rather. That is, God not only wanted to create humanity, He also wanted to help humanity know Him by giving them a witness to his existence in nature. We read in De Verbum, God who through the word creates all things and keeps them in existence, gives men an enduring witness to himself in created realities. And according to De Verbum, God was not content with giving humans a witness in nature. He also chose to give them what we might call a spoken revelation. That is, he chose to speak to the first humans. De Ver Verbum continues, Planning to make known the way of heavenly salvation, God went further and from the start manifested himself to our parents, which of course is an allusion to Adam and Eve. Now of special importance is one thing which God said to Adam and Eve. In the book of Genesis, after Adam and Eve have sinned, God speaks to the serpent, who from a Christian perspective, of course, is not just a snake, but is an incarnation of the evil one himself, of the devil, and declares, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And here's the key point, the end of this verse. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now, from a Christian perspective, this verse isn't about, let's say, problems between snakes and humans but rather it is a prediction that evil represented by the serpent will be eventually overcome by good and notably through an offspring of Eve. This is why Christian theologians have long described this verse, which is of course in Genesis, right? The first book in the Bible. But Christian theologians have seen this as a proto-gospel or a proto-evangelium. It is a prophetic announcement of the good news that a Savior, Christ, will come to humanity. Hence we can understand, I don't know if you've seen the movie, but at the very opening of Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, there's a scene where Christ is in the Garden of Gethsemane going through his temptation. But at the end of that temptation scene, a serpent sort of appears from the base of a tree and he crushes it with his foot. So it's, it's a, a visual presentation of this verse that's also seen in a more important way, in my humble opinion, <laughs> on the campus of Notre Dame, where we have the Golden Dome, which is great. People always say the Golden Dome, but of course, who's on top of the Golden Dome? It's Mary. And if you look close enough, or if you climb up there, not, uh, not that I'm suggesting that you do that, you would be able to see uh, Mary is crushing a serpent. And that's connected to the book of Revelation also, uh, which has her defeat the serpent. But that's also related to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. In any case, the Christian reading of this verse in Genesis is the starting point of what we can describe as the Christological perspective of divine revelation. All of human history from this perspective leads to Christ. Between Adam and Christ, of course, God continued to speak to humanity, first to Noah, then to those figures whom Christians call patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. In a special way, God developed a relationship with the 12 sons of Jacob, the guy who incidentally would have his name changed to Israel, and their descendants. While God is Lord of the entire world, He chose these Israelites for a special revelation, the law given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And during Israel's history, he called out to certain figures whom Jews and Christians call prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. 
God taught one prophet named Jonah a lesson about his love for the entire world by having him preach to Israel's enemy, Assyria. Jonah, of course, resisted and ended up in the belly of a big fish. All of this sacred history reflects God's spoken revelation. So he's spoken of created revelation and spoken revelation. With Christ, however, something new happens. Christ, from a Christian perspective, is not simply a prophet. He is God's personal revelation. Thus, the author of another New Testament book, the letter to the Hebrews, makes a profound contrast between the way God spoke to the prophets and the way God revealed himself through Christ. This is in the book of Hebrews, um, where Christ is described as the appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. In other words, from a Christian perspective, the fullness of revelation is Christ himself. That is why Christ is known by Christians as the Word of God, as seen most clearly in the opening of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Although we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, we might note that in two places, that is chapter 3 and chapter 4 of the Qur'an, the Qur'an, the Muslim scripture, or the Islamic scripture, also speaks of Jesus as a word of God. The Arabic word is kalima. Incidentally, the Qur'an, just a basic preview, is a book according to Islamic convictions revealed by God through the angel Gabriel to the prophet Muhammad. It's organized into 114 chapters. These chapters are organized roughly by length. It dates to the 7th century. The traditional dates of the prophet's mission are 610 to 632 AD. Telling me, however, in Quran chapter 3, Jesus is described as a word from God and not the word. Still, even if certain Christian expressions have entered into the Quran, like referring to Jesus as the word of God, from an Islamic perspective, these expressions have a much more limited sense and do not imply the divinity of Christ. Christ in the Quran is neither son of God nor divine himself. For Christians, on the other hand, the fullness of divine revelation is the person of Jesus Christ. This is why we sometimes hear that it's better not to compare the Bible and the Quran, which is too bad because that's what I'm doing tonight, <laughs> uh, but rather to compare Jesus and the Quran. Jesus, who for Christians is the word of God come from heaven, to the Quran, who for Muslims is the word of God come from heaven. Or I we sometimes hear of a comparison between Mary, who from a Christian perspective bore the word of God, Christ, inside of her, and Muhammad, who from a Muslim perspective bore the word of God, the Quran, inside of him. We'll get back to this point. But if Jesus is the word of God, what place does this leave from a Christian perspective for the Bible? Now, from a Christian perspective, the Bible is not the word of God in the same sense as the Quran is the word of God from a Muslim perspective. The Bible is not a book which came from heaven to earth. The Bible is rather a record of the relationship between God and humanity and history. And all, although I might verge on heresy here, one could say that for Christians, Christianity could exist without the Bible. And indeed, it did exist without the Bible in the very beginning of Christian history. But from an Islamic perspective, it's difficult to imagine Islam without the Quran, just as you couldn't imagine Christianity without Jesus. Thus, the Bible, from a Christian perspective, has a more limited role. It preserves God's word. De Verbum declares that God, in his gracious goodness, has seen to it that what he had revealed for the salvation of all nations would abide perpetually in its full integrity. That was the role of the Bible. Here we might pause to make an important distinction. While the New Testament contains four Gospels, the Quran does speak of God revealing a scripture to Jesus, which is named the Injil. Now the Arabic term Injil derives ultimately from the Greek term for gospel, which is euangelia, with a different conception. Indeed, the Christian idea of gospels is unlike the Islamic idea of the Injil. The Injil for Muslims is a book brought down from heaven to earth to Jesus, much as the Quran for Muslims is a book brought down from heaven to earth to Muhammad. 
Still, it's important to emphasize how the church teaches that all of the Bible, the Old and the New Testament, was written on the gui under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So even though its role is more limited and it's preserving God's word, which is Christ himself, it's still inspired by God and free from error. The church also teaches, and this is an important point if we want to compare the two faiths, that the Bible contains the final word that God has revealed to humanity until the return of Christ. De Verbum uh, reads, the Christian dispensation, therefore, as the new and definitive covenant, will never pass away, and we now await no further new public revelation before the glorious manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And just to skip ahead again to give you a preview, Islamic teaching is that Muhammad was the last prophet. The Quran in chapter 33, verse 40, speaks of him as the seal of the prophets. To sum up, though, for Christianity, according to the Christian conception, there are three sorts of revelation. Natural revelation, verbal revelation, and personal revelation. The greatest of these is the personal revelation of God in Christ. It is definitive and will never pass away. Now, while this point obviously distinguishes the Christian idea of revelation, there is still much in the Islamic conception of divine revelation that agrees with Christianity. For Islam, too, the things of nature are signs. The Arabic term is ayat, which point to God. Many Quranic passages, passages give specific examples of these signs. As in Quran, chapter 6, verse 99, I won't read all of it, but it speaks of the rain which gives um, the earth fruit and vegetation as a sign which comes from God. The end of the verse declares, there are indeed signs in that for a people who have faith. The Quran, one might say, sees nature as a mirror of divine power. That is, by looking at nature, one is able to recognize God. But we might add two additional points to this. First, by pointing to nature, the Quran seeks to argue not only for the existence and power of God, but also to the reality of the resurrection of the body. In passages such as chapter, or the Arabic word is surah, 50, in Arabic qaf, Verses 6 to 11, the Quran sees the bringing back to life of a dry land by rain as parallel to God's raising dead bodies to life. We read, we send down from the sky water, which we grow gardens, etc. And with it we revive a dead country, likewise will be the rising of the dead. Second, these are two ways in which the Islamic teaching on creation is distinct. The Qur'an expects not only that humans will recognize the existence of God by observing the signs of nature, but also that humans will respond to the good things of nature with gratitude. To this end, chapter 16, a nahl in the Qur'an, calls on humans to give thanks to God even for their, <coughs> their faculties, for their senses. This passage reads, God has brought forth from the bellies of your mother while you did not know anything. He invested you with hearing, sight, and the hearts, which may refer to the intellect, actually, so that you may give thanks. A few verses later, the same sort of speaks of various blessings God has given and speaks of them as reasons why humans should submit to God. We read, it's God who made for the shade, other elements of nature, and the verse concludes, that is how he completes his blessing upon you, that you may submit to him. Now the interesting thing about this expression is in Arabic, it's la'alakum tuslimun, and that word tuslimun can be understood to mean that you may be Muslims. The, the word Muslim in English means one who submits to God, and Islam is submission. To the Japanese scholar of Islam, Toshihiku Izutsu, the Qur'an's vision of human gratitude, in Arabic shuk, is the human counterpart of the initial divine goodness. Izutsu writes, the Qur'an may be regarded in a certain sense as a grand hymn in honor of divine creation. Yet in addition to these natural signs, the Qur'an also describes God's verbal signs, the word which he has given to prophets. 
These two are referred to in the Quran with the same Arabic word as the signs of nature, that is, ayat. And indeed, individual verses in the Quran are referred to as ayat. For example, when Abraham and his son, Ishmael, not Isaac, pray in chapter 2 of the Quran for a prophet to be raised for their people, Muslims read this incidentally as a prophecy of the coming of Muhammad, they ask God that this prophet who will come in the future will recite God's ayat. He, we read, Our Lord, raise amongst them an apostle from among them who will recite to them your signs, your ayat. Thus for the Quran too, we can distinguish between natural revelation and the verbal revelation given to prophets. God sends prophets as warners so that humans will turn back to God and avoid divine punishment. Quran chapter 17 verse 15 declares, We do not punish any community until we have sent it an apostle. From the Quran's perspective, this warning given by prophets is itself an expression of divine mercy. Thus we understand why the Quran speaks of its own prophet as a mercy in Surah or chapter 21. In any case, another way to think of the natural and verbal distinction for the Quran is that there are two sorts of signs. First, the signs which are non-verbal, the signs of nature. These are given to everyone, even to non-believers, even to Christians, even to atheists. And then there are the verbal signs which are given only to prophets, the words given by God to the prophets. However, even if they're given only to a prophet, they are preserved in the scripture which is available to mankind. For Muslims, of course, this is the Quran, which is the very words of God. We've already mentioned it. But to complete this circle and to give a full presentation of revelation from an Islamic perspective, one, mention, one must mention, and especially from a Sunni Islamic perspective, that it's important to remember that a prophet for Islam is not only a mouthpiece of divine revelation. The prophet does not only repeat the words which he hears from an angel. The prophet is also what we might call an exemplar. In Arabic, the term is uswa, to use a Quranic term. God sends a prophet not only that people will listen to the verbal revelation he receives, but also that people might imitate him. And you might remember there was a trend that was popular, especially among Christian young people in recent years, which was to wear bracelets or something else that had the letters WWJD. I don't know if anyone remembers that. What would Jesus do? But from this perspective, we could see that WWMD, what would Muhammad do, is very important from a Muslim perspective. In any case, from an Islamic point of view, we also have three sorts of revelation, although they are different. The signs of nature, the signs given to the prophet, and the prophet himself as an exemplar or a sign. So we could sum up the two systems of revelation as follows. For Christianity, natural revelation, verbal revelation, personal revelation, sort of in increasing order of importance. And for Islam, signs of nature, signs spoken by a prophet, the Quran, and the prophet as a sign. And the traditions about the prophet are gathered in literature known as the Hadith. Then we move on to the literary relationship, which means that you're about halfway through, which is good news. <laughs> We've seen that from a theological perspective, the role which the Bible plays in Christianity is unlike the role which the Quran plays in Islam. The Quran, we have suggested, is better compared to the Christian conception of Jesus. But from a literary perspective, after all, these are both texts, books with words in them. And they can be compared. And what is more, they have a lot in common. Both of these texts share a similar cosmology, or vision of heaven and earth. They share a similar view of sacred history. Both scriptures give a central place to Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Mary. And they also share a similar eschatology, or their vision of the end times and divine judgment. Both speak of the resurrection and of heaven and hell. And yet the relationship between the Bible and the Quran is more complicated than it might seem at first sight. For example, did you know the Quran, even though it comes about 600 years after the lifetime of Jesus, 
And several hundred years after the closing of the canon of the Bible, it rarely quotes or cites biblical passages. It does, however, refer to biblical turns of phrase, very short, we might call locution, statements. The Quran, for example, speaks of uncircumcised hearts and a camel passing through the eye of the needle, which we know from the Gospels. It uses the example of a mustard seed to refer to something very small. But in each of these cases, the Quran applies the biblical turn of phrase to a different teaching. For example, the camel passing through the eye of the needle is not related to a rich man, but rather to someone who denies the signs of God. In order to illustrate the complicated relationship between the Quran and the Bible, I will focus on two Quranic narratives <coughs> and consider the relationship to the Bible. Namely, the story of Noah and his son, just one son, and we'll explain about this, and then the story of Moses and Pharaoh. And we'll begin with Noah. I love this slide because it's from the movie, as you may know. And even though the movie is not close to the Bible or the Quran, in this slide, I don't know if I have a... Oh, hold on. Wait, I think I found it. Yep. In this slide, if you look closely at this guy here, he's just wearing a raincoat with a little like hood, as we have today, which I thought in the days of Noah is very interesting. <laughs> okay, but that's not the point. <laughs> okay, um, a general introduction to Noah, and then I'll focus in a little bit on this particular narrative of Noah and his son and speak about its relationship to the Bible. So, the Quran includes seven significant Noah narratives and refers to Noah in numerous other passages. The Noah of the Quran is unlike the Noah of the Bible in as much as the Quranic narratives do not focus on the flood itself, but they focus instead on the relationship between Noah and his unbelieving people. The story of Noah in the Quran is one of a series of stories that scholars like to call punishment stories. And they have several stages or steps in them. First, the prophet is called. Second, the prophet preaches to his people and warns them of divine punishment. Third, God destroys the unbelievers and saves the prophet together with a small group of believers. Some of the prophets in these stories are unknown to the Bible, prophets such as Hud, Saleh, and Shu'ayb, but a number of them, including Noah, Lot, and Moses, are biblical figures. Now the Quran, one surmises, chooses to reflect on the biblical narrative of Noah, or of Lot, or of Moses, and not, let's say, that of Isaiah or Ezekiel, because of the plot line of the narrative, ending as it does with the star and his family saved and everyone else destroyed, this is easily adapted into the format of punishment stories, which the Quran uses to advance its religious exhortations. At the same time, however, the details of the biblical narrative of Noah become necessary elements of the Quranic account. So it follows the general storyline, but changes it in certain ways which are key. In fact, I'd like to focus on two ways in which the story of Noah is different. First. Noah in the Quran is a preacher. He preaches to his people. And second, Noah in the Quran has one son who's mentioned only, and this son does not get into the ark at all, but is lost in the flood. Let's start with the preaching. The Quran includes a number of long narratives in which Noah speaks to his people in order to convince them to believe in God and accept that he, Noah, is a prophet. Here's one example. We won't read through the whole thing, but you can read it on your own. It's the interchange between Noah and his people. Such passages are quite unlike Genesis in the Old Testament of the Bible, which does not have Noah speak a single word until he gets out of the ark. However, it is interesting to note that in the New Testament, in the second letter of Peter, Noah is nevertheless described as a preacher. So the Quran is not emerging out of nowhere by having Noah preach. There's something here in the New Testament already. And we can imagine why, because in the book of Genesis, Noah is described as a righteous man. And one can only imagine, if he were truly righteous, he knew this disaster were coming, and he was building this ark to save his family, 
he would have said something to all the people around him who are going to be destroyed. <laughs> you can imagine how this logic would work. And in Second Peter, indeed, he's described as a preacher. And indeed, in the period between the New Testament and the writing of the Quran, this idea is expanded. Both Jewish and Christian authors speak about the preaching of Noah in distinctive ways. In the Jewish text known as the Talmud, we have Noah's preaching quoted. And then in Christian commentaries, such as this, a scholar who wrote in a language called Syriac named Ephraim, and another scholar who wrote in a language, or the same language, Syriac, known as Jacob of Sirug, they both say that Noah preached for a hundred years. If you could see it here, 500, 100 years he preached to. Here as well, he preached for 100 years. Yeah, so not only he preached, he preached for a long time. <laughs> the references in Ephraim and Jacob, th these last two references, are particularly interesting because the language that they wrote in, which I've mentioned, Syriac, is very close to the language of the Quran, which is Arabic. It helps us see that the way in which the Quran presents Noah as a preacher is not entirely new and is indeed consistent with the way Christians were thinking about him in, his, in the Qur'an's time and place. As for the second matter, Noah's lost son, he appears in chapter 11, or Surat Hud, and I won't read the whole passage again, but we have this intriguing story in which Noah and his son speak to each other. Noah calls out to his son, asking him to board the ark, and the son says he'd rather take refuge on a mountain. Bad idea. Uh, and uh, Noah says nothing can protect you from God's decree. And the son apparently, although it's not said explicitly, is lost in the waves of the flood. As the story continues, and this is interesting, Noah seems to complain about the drowning of his son. Noah declares, my lord, my son is indeed from my family. Your promise is indeed true. But God rebukes Noah, and he says, he is not of your family. And that's a key interchange, I think. Because this phrase, he is not of your family, even though biologically he was, even though some Muslim scholars who speculated that maybe actually that should be understood literally and that Noah's wife had betrayed him, and we won't go down that road. Um, but now this phrase, it, it probably is meant to mean that he, he, he's no longer to be thought of a, as a son because he's chosen to be with unbelievers and not with believers. In other words, this conversation between Noah and God reminds us of an important doctrine of the Quran that faith comes before family. The same lesson is taught in the various Quranic passages which describe Abraham's conversation with his father. So now it's not the prophet and his son, it's the prophet and his father. The father of Abraham, in this too is found in earlier Jewish and Christian writings, though not in the Bible, but I won't go to, into detail about that. But the father of Abraham appears to be in the Quran, not only an idolater, someone who worships idols, but himself a maker of idols. And while the crime or the heresy of Noah's son is left unnamed, he does choose to be with the unbelievers. In other words, while Abraham rejects his father for his unbelief, Noah rejects his son for his unbelief. The case of Noah's son, unbelieving son, however, makes a more dramatic contest with the, contrast with the Bible. In Genesis, of course, Noah has three sons. They all get into the ark. What is more, there is no sign of this extra son in the New Testament or in later Jewish and Christian writings. However, there is one way to understand the appearance of the son on the basis of the Bible. Because when we turn to the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, we find a fascinating passage in chapter 14. Here the point is made that the merits of a father will do nothing for a sinful son. And this is an important conversation actually within Judaism. It has to do with a concept known as zikut avot, which means the merits of the fathers. But Ezekiel in this passage is arguing against that concept. And Ezekiel uses the example of Noah, presumably because Noah is known for righteousness, to make this point. Right? 
even if Noah, and he mentions Daniel and Job, were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver but their own lives by their righteousness. In this passage, God speaks hypothetically of a sinful son of Noah who would hypothetically die, whereas the Quran speaks literally of a son of Noah who literally did die in the flood. The Quran also applies the story of Noah's lost son to a different argument, namely that believers in its God should break their bonds with unbelievers, even if the unbelievers are family members. This lesson is taught explicitly in Surah the Tawbah, which is chapter 9, which refers to the account of Abraham that we've spoken uh, uh, about just a moment ago. The prophet and the faithful may not plead for the forgiveness of the polytheists, even if they should be their relatives. We could speak more about this during the question and answer time, and of course, it can be interpreted in different ways. There are some traditions that it's okay to pray for the conversion of non-Muslims to Islam, but you shouldn't pray for their forgiveness on the basis of this verse. Again, we could speak more about this. In any case, the incident of Noah and his unbelieving son is part of a Quranic theme. Abraham and Noah both pleaded to God for an unbelieving family member and their prayers were denied. Thereby, the followers of the Quran's prophet know not to pray for the forgiveness of unbelievers. And more importantly, they learn that faith comes before family. Now, in our second example, which is Moses, you may recognize this Moses, affectionately known on the campus of Notre Dame as First Down Moses. Um, a similar lesson could be derived from the surah entitled Ashu'ara, or the poets, where the Quran relates a conversation now between Pharaoh and Moses, and the intriguing thing about this conversation is, just as we had Noah and his son, and Abraham and his father, Pharaoh, in this passage, appears to be the adoptive father of Moses. Although this verse does not say so explicitly, when read together with Quran 28.9, it suggests that Pharaoh himself adopted Moses as his own son. In that verse, the Quran has Pharaoh's wife, and not his daughter, as we find in Exodus, declared to Pharaoh her desire to adopt Moses as a son. We have it there. Maybe he will benefit us, or we will adopt him as a son. Now these two passages are ultimately related to Exodus chapter 2, verse 10. And as I mentioned in Exodus, it's the daughter of Pharaoh who adopts Moses as a son. In the Quran, it's Pharaoh himself and his wife who do so. Why? Why this difference? Why in Exodus do we find the daughter who adopts Moses? And in the Quran, it's the Pharaoh himself, or Pharaoh and his wife, who do so. Above all, it is important to know, in solving this riddle, that the very idea of a conversation between Pharaoh and Moses in the Quran appears to be a reunion. Let me just backtrack a second. In this passage in Quran 26, the Pharaoh of Moses' adulthood says to him, did we not rear you as a child among us, and did you not stay with us for years of your life? Now what's curious about this is another contrast between the Quran and the Bible. Because in the Bible, in the book of Exodus, the Pharaoh of Moses' childhood is not the Pharaoh of his adulthood. And we can make this quite clear, I think we've got it up here. What we read about is that the Pharaoh of Moses' childhood seeks to kill him when the news has gone out that Moses has killed an Egyptian. We read that in Exodus chapter 2, verse 15. And then a couple chapters later, we learn that the, so Moses goes off and he flees to a land called Midian. And then we learn that the reason why Moses returns from Midian back to Egypt is because, chapter 4, verse 19, all the men who are seeking your life, that must include Pharaoh, right, are dead. In other words, we have a story in the Quran which has Pharaoh as the father and Moses as the son, whereas this is not possible in Exodus because the Pharaoh who is Pharaoh in Moses' childhood is not the one of his adulthood. Now, 
it's not the point of the talk, but an analysis would show that in the Quran, Pharaoh actually is used not so much as a title of a ruler, but as the name of that particular, of the ruler of Egypt who lived during Moses' lifetime, but I don't have to go there now. Just in, in the story of Joseph in the Quran, the ruler is never called Pharaoh, he's only called king. That's in chapter 12 of the Quran. In any case, we get the point. All right. Now, this point about the contrast between Exodus and the Quran in terms of one pharaoh or two pharaohs has been noted by scholars for a long time. I'm not saying anything revolutionary here or any, adding anything uh, much. But in my opinion, the reason that explains why the Quran has only one pharaoh and makes him the adoptive father of Moses is because the Quran wants a confrontation between father and son. Much as it has the confrontation between Noah and his lost son and between Abraham <clears throat> and his idolatrous father. In other words, Pharaoh's daughter must give way to Pharaoh's wife. The way in which the Quran makes the encounter between Pharaoh and Moses a family affair reflects a central theme of its religious exhortation, which we have already encountered in our discussions of Noah, namely that faith comes before family. The Quran's concern with this theme is seen in the way it often portrays unbelievers who do things the other way around. What keeps people from converting to Islam, the Quran asks. Why do they stubbornly hold on to their old religion? Because they're following the habits of their fathers. They're obeying family and not faith. When they are told, follow what God has sent down, they say, we will rather follow that we have, that we, what we have found our fathers following. Again, another verse says, when they are told, come to what Allah has sent down to the apostle, they say, we, as sufficient for us is what we have found our fathers following, etc. In Quran 23, 24, Noah's opponents reject him with a declaration, we have never heard of such a thing among our forefathers. Not only does the Quran warn its audience not to follow the false religion of family members, it commands the, its audience to separate themselves entirely from unbelieving members of their family. Oh, you have faith. Do not befriend your fathers and brothers if they prefer faithlessness to faith. Those of you who befriend them, it is they who are the wrongdoers. And there's some controversy about how to understand the word for befriending here. It has to do with the term walaya in the Quran, which may be understood rather a sort of a dominant relationship and not friendship. In any case, the Quran means to present the story of Moses and Pharaoh according to show that prophets choose God over family. The point of this is to deliver a message to Muhammad's own audience, to follow the example of the prophets who preached to, confronted, and when necessary, abandoned unbelievers in order to dedicate their lives to God. Indeed, in the passage which concerns us in Surah 26, the Quran seems to make this message particularly dramatic. At the end of this dialogue, Pharaoh declares to Moses, if you take up any god other than me, I will surely make you a prisoner. That is, Pharaoh not only claims rights over Moses as his father, he also claims to take the place of God himself. Finally, some interfaith implications and a few reflections on how to read Quran and Bible together. The Quranic theme of choosing God over family shouldn't shock us, and indeed it should be familiar to Christians as well. The Gospel of Matthew has Jesus predict that his message will divide family members against each other. He insists that only those who love him more than their family are worthy of him. Jesus declares, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In another gospel declaration, Jesus declares, truly I say to you, there is no man who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive manifold more in this time in the age to come, eternal life. In other words, both religious traditions share a conviction that the bonds of family must be broken if they hold people back from following God. 
The Quran's interest in the theme of faith over family is presumably connected to the particular circumstances of its development. One imagines that the Quran's prophet wanted to encourage his followers to be faithful to their new community and to break off ties with those who are outside of that community, even if they were family members. One might imagine the same thing for the message that we just read in the New Testament. In any case, we see that the way that the Quran differs from the Bible at least in these two cases, is not random or accidental. The Quran is not misquoting or misunderstanding the Bible. It's reapplying or shaping the Bible for its own particular message. The Quran transforms biblical accounts. It makes the hypothetical son of Noah into a real son. And it turns Moses into the adopted son of Pharaoh. But it does so with a purpose. Thus, there is a certain tension between the Qur'an and the Bible. The Qur'an is a text which follows in the biblical tradition for the most part, but also departs from it in certain significant ways. And it is only in a sincere appreciation of the similarities and differences of the two texts that dialogue between Christians and Muslims might be fruitful. Thank you. Does Islam have a, a sense of development of its theology? I think it's on. It's on. Does Islam have a, a, a sense of originalism, no development of its theology? Uh, or does it develop? Does it change as well? Right. So, um, great question. Uh, how do we understand the development of theology in Islam? And part of it depends on how we define that term theology. In Islamic tradition, there's one particular science known as kalam in Arabic, which is generally rendered <coughs> as theology. So those are texts which have to do with rational reflection on God. And that's a very rich tradition with different schools. And there are particular kalam perspectives within Sunni Islam and within, within Shiite Islam. And then there are reformist modern trends. And some of the questions which are debated don't, don't have a political element, but they're simply things about God. For example, can God be seen in the afterlife? This was a big question. Or can anyone intercede with God? Does the Prophet Muhammad or anyone else have the right to intercede for his community to help them have their sins forgiven and enter into paradise? Um, uh, is, the, is the Quran an eternal text or was it created when God spoke? So all of these questions have been de debated for centuries and continue to be debated. If you mean um, are, are the reformist or modern trends, of, of course there are. Uh, today uh, there's a rich diversity in theological thinking among Muslims and uh, also on particular political questions. Uh, how does Islam relate to democracy? How, what is, teachings does Islam hold on women? There's a, an immense diversity, and in fact, in, in some ways, um, the diversity is particularly um, notable because there's no central authority in Islam. I think in the introduction, someone mentioned Al-Azhar, which has a certain prestige in Sunni Islam, but it's not the same as the Vatican. There's no pope, and so individual Muslim thinkers develop their own thoughts on theological issues. <coughs> Um, this is this is similar, but not with the religion so much as just with these scriptures, because of, of of the way the Bible comes about through so many centuries, so many authors, everything from historic to mythic to all these different ideas. Because of the way the Quran comes about, is, is there a, a more strict adherence to to a literalism because this was this was the word, where I know that you know, uh, biblical scholars will sit around and argue over what an author might have not meant or might have meant, but if this is a direct recitation, 
does that connect it more to a literalism for interpretation purposes? Yeah, great question and difficult one to answer. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a very good question. Um, so, uh, in classical Islam already, there are intense debates about whether certain passages can be understood metaphorically. So just, I can give a couple of examples. The Quran speaks on several places about um, God seeking vengeance. The word is intiqam, or God says, inna um, muntaqameen. And, and Muslim scholars ask, well, can we say this of God, that God would seek vengeance? Is that appropriate? Or does vengeance, is that just to be understood symbolically as punishment? which is more appropriate for God. Or the Quran says that, in one place, it seems to say that God, he schemes or tricks. The word is mekr in Arabic. Can God scheme or trick? Or do we understand that in another sense as it's actually the humans that are tricking themselves or something like that? Um, even more basic, the Quran speaks, seems to speak about God sitting down on the throne. You know, can God actually sit down, like how do we understand that? Is that something we understand, the anthropomorphism in the Quran? Okay, now, but when it comes to more legal or political things, it, um, it's true that the Quran has the, the primary place in Islamic legal and political thinking. Um, Islamic jurisprudence has four sources. The first of these is the Quran, it's the most important. Um, the hadith and other um, methods have a certain role as well, but the Quran has a certain place, and we shouldn't underestimate the place that the Quran has in Islamic spirituality. Muslims consider the Quran to be inimitable, so the perfect book, both in terms of its message and in terms of the Arabic language itself. So I would say that um, it, there's a, 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 a fundamental role in Islamic thinking that the Quran plays, but that doesn't always mean a literal interpretation. I have two questions, if I may. The first is, is there an original text of the Quran that still is in existence? Hold the mic closer. Yeah. Is there an original text of the Quran that's still in existence? Okay, so that's a, that's a great question, another great question. And uh, I wish I had a warning for all of these. <laughs> um, okay, so um, the first thing to say is that in Islamic tradition, the, the oral transmission of the Quran plays a fundamental role in Islamic thinking, right? So if you ask, you know, an imam or someone coming from a, a more pious Muslim perspective, they would say the manuscripts are especially important because the Quran was perfectly memorized by the companions of the Prophet and passed down to every generation. And so, right? Um, okay, but scholars coming from sort of a secular perspective, um, as I do, we're interested in the manuscripts, we do want to know, and um, what, there's all sorts of controversies about dating the manuscripts. Some have been dated very early, some, and there's problems with the dating because some have been dated before the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, which doesn't <laughs> seem possible. So, um, but uh, what, what, we, what we're missing in the field of Quranic studies is what we call a critical edition of the text. So we don't have any edition of the text that's based only on the manuscripts. The Quran in Arabic that people read today was produced in 1924 by the Ministry of Education in Egypt, and it's just become the standard text, and everyone uses it, scholars as well use it. Um, but we don't yet have a text that's based on those manuscripts. As for the dating of those manuscripts, it's, it's really uncertain, but most people think they're pretty early, the middle of the seventh century. My second yep. question is, do you have a recommendation for uh, a translation of the Quran that has uh, especially some explanatory commentaries with it? Yeah, so two, two recommendations, great question. So uh, for what I would call a scholarly or critical translation of the Quran, which will give um, notes from an academic perspective, is someone named Droge, D-R-O-G-E, um, which is, I think, an excellent translation and an excellent scholarly work. Um, if you're more interested in understanding Islamic commentary, so Muslim perspectives, there's now uh, um, a book known as The Study Quran by Harper Collins, or a very popular Muslim translation of the Quran is by someone named Abdul Halim, and that's a lot cheaper, and in paperback, um, that's produced by Oxford. So you could just look for the Oxford translation of the Quran. And so those latter two would give you more of the traditional Islamic perspective.
Thank you. So I know in the Christian religion, there's um, this call to convert, you know, bring in the other flock, you know, bring people to the religion. And I don't know if there's something similar in Islam, but if in fact there is, if these two factions both have the charge from God to convert everyone to their religion, how can we ever expect to find some common ground? Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, good point. Yeah, I mean, both, both religions as understood by, I would say, the majority traditions, because both are you know, diverse religions, have an evangelical, it's probably not the right word, maybe just say a missionary um, impulse. <coughs> Yeah, it's very important in Islam. It, it's, Muslims generally refer to it as da'wah, which means a, literally means a call. And if you go uh, on the, uh, online and you type, uh, just type in Islam or Islam today or become a Muslim or why convert to Islam, you'll have you know, hundreds or thousands of sites. Um, Muslim missionaries, a bit like Christian missionaries, like Billy Graham, who become sort of legendary in certain circles in the U.S., but figures like Ahmed Didad from South Africa or Zakir Naik from India who are big preachers seeking to convert people to Islam, they become celebrities. So, so yes, if you go to speaker, Speaker's Corner in London, someone was telling me they were in Chicago the other day and there were street preachers, were not, not Christians, but Muslims. So that's part of Islam as well. Um, so, uh, but also, you know, Islam also has a call to dialogue. There's a famous verse in chapter 29 of the Quran which says, do not um, debate or dialogue with Christians except in the best way. There's a verse in chapter 3 of the Quran which says, O people of the book, let us come to a common word. So there are resources also and passages in the Quran which form the basis for the notion of dialogue, as there are in Christianity as well. You know, when Paul goes to, to Athens, he doesn't just say, like, you know, Jesus died for your sins, accept him as your personal Lord or Savior, you're going to hell. He engages them on their own terms. He speaks, I see you have many gods. He talk so there are resources in both texts that could form the basis of dialogue. I think. There's, it's up there and then maybe down here. Yeah. Uh, we call God and Catholicism our Father, merciful Father. And what do the Muslims call Muhammad. Right, so uh, important to, to um, be very clear about Muhammad and God, God in the um, Islamic system. Of course, for Muslims, Muhammad was just a prophet and a man, and he, he lived his life dedicated to God and died. And he's buried, he's in Medina in Saudi Arabia. Um, there's a famous uh, tradition, not in the Quran, but in other writings, where um, the first leader of Islam after Muhammad's life says, if anyone worships Muhammad, well, Muhammad is dead, but if every, anyone worships God, he's alive in heaven. So for Muslims, that's very important, that you know, Muhammad is just a prophet, and God is, yeah. Um, Muslims do not speak of God as father. The Quran never calls God father. So that's interesting. That's a distinction. I mean, it's... It's important to note that there are differences in theology. Of course, there are big ones like the Trinity and the Incarnation. But even there are distinctive points in Islam. God is not Father, but God is certainly merciful. That's very important for Islam. And the Quran actually refers to God simply as like God's proper name, the Merciful. It just speaks of Him as Arahman. <coughs> so the notion of divine mercy is very important. Yeah. Of course, the Arabic name for God is Allah, which you hear a lot now. And even in the translation I used, that translator said, our idea of God is so distinct that I'm not going to translate that word at all. I'm going to keep it as Allah in English. What is it about Islam or about the Quran that rationalizes for the radical Islamic part of Islam that rationalizes for them their radicalism. Uh, when, right, I mean, when speaking about Islam, it's important to emphasize the diversity, and as I mentioned before, there's no central authority. And so we have different currents in Islam, and among the currents in Islam is a current known as Salafism. 
And some of the extremist movements, I mean, we shouldn't try to explain away completely extremist movements. They are there, they are, you know, and many people, Muslims and Christians, have been victims of them. So there's one of the movements is known as Salafism, and one movement within Salafism we refer to as Salafi Jihadism. So most Salafis, even though they're very, very religious and very interested in converting people to Islam, they're not violent. They're just a very pious people. But there are some Salafis who believe that um, there's basically perpetual warfare between m believers and unbelievers. But that's, I hope I made it clear, that's a small segment of a small segment of the Islamic population. Um, and it has to do with a particular reading of the text. So they read the text and the traditions in certain ways that the majority of Muslims do not read the text in. Well, I mean, in terms of um, of mission, I think the two religions are, are quite similar. I mean, Christians look at the Great Commission at the end of gospel, the Gospel of Matthew. In the Quran, uh, Muslims look at all of the examples of the verb uh, da, um, which means to call. Uh, and they look at the Prophet Muhammad's own call to people to convert to Islam. They want to imitate that. Uh, in terms of violence, of course, there were times where um, the church um, justified violence and uh, celebrated it um, at different points. So it's certainly possible to read the Christian texts. Um, of course, the church has authority uh, in a centralized way, and so um, it used that at certain points, obviously with the Crusades and at other points, to, to advocate for violence as well. I had two questions, if you don't mind. One's an easy one. I had a friend recommend Reliance of the Traveler as a translation. Is that... Well, one yeah. Recommend? Re Reliance of the Traveler is a medieval, uh, a medieval legal handbook from one of the four Sunni schools that gives very detailed descriptions of like how you should dress, what food you should eat, what you should wear. It's not the Quran, and it's not the Hadith. It's a, a, a Muslim legal thinker who's putting those both together and coming to decisions. So, I mean, if you had a question about is singing allowed in Islam, you would go to that book go to the index, look up singing, and then you'd have an answer. But if you wanted just an introduction to Islam, it's probably not the place to begin. Yeah. Okay, and then the second question, I apologize, I don't quite know how to phrase it in a way that asks what I'm really looking for. Um, comparing the Bible and the Quran side by side, and it might be a cultural thing, I don't know. My understanding is that the word love is mentioned countless times in the Bible as compared with the Quran where it doesn't seem to be a focus for their religious Yeah, practices. that's a good, that's an interesting point actually. So um, does, yeah, the relationship, so the word love does appear in the Quran. It's ahabba. Yeah, the interesting thing about it is, um, is it appropriate to speak of um, of God's unconditional love in Islam, because the Quran speaks both of God, the, the ones whom God loves, and the one whom God does not love. So He loves, He loves the believers, He loves those who serve Him, etc., et and He doesn't love these other class of people. Um, and so, Muslims would would often say, for us, the the central term in the Quran is is not love, just because that's used in a very distinct way. Um, the universal quality of God in the Quran is mercy. And they would say, but mercy appears very frequently in the text. Whereas love is, God loves some, he doesn't love others. Um, God is merciful to everyone. That's all right, I'm loud enough. <laughs> Can you explain the, the two branches, the two principal factions uh, of Islam, uh, Shia and, and uh, uh, Sunni? Yes. So what, what are the differences? So that, that's a, a big one. <laughs> um, maybe I could just mention two things, and then there's much more to be said, and uh, the Notre Dame Club of Denver will have to invite me back. <laughs> but, um, you know, classically, most people would say it has to do with the notion of leadership, what in Islam and Arabic is known as imama, so leadership in the Islamic community. And from, from a Sunni perspective, um, Muhammad did not designate someone to succeed him in his lifetime, 
but the community wisely chose his close friend and associate, whose name was Abu Bakr, who really did become the first leader or caliph. And Shiites would say, no, Muhammad designated his cousin and son-in-law, whose name was Ali. Right? So that, that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that um, in, in Shiism, um, there's a lot of devotion around uh, both Ali and his descendants, um, who are known collectively as Imams. And that makes Shiism very distinct. Um, and they have particular stories that usually end in martyrdom. And they, they are considered to be infallible, along with the prophets, and to have the power of intercession, along with maybe the Prophet Muhammad. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of devotion on these Imams. And not only that, the Shiites are waiting for the last of those Imams to return. So anyway, I'd have to go into more detail to make that really clear. But um, leadership and then this, this notion of Imams. My impression was that Christianity and Islam have somewhat of a similar issue. And it's not radicalism. It's uh, indifference. And the Christians are more and more becoming indifferent, and they're becoming more atheistic, and they don't care about religion. And I saw that. It seemed to me in Turkey that most people didn't get alarmed about Islam. And is that true? I mean, it's anecdotal, clearly. Yeah, I, I would say that, um, I, I don't know so much from the Christian point of view, I'd just be guessing, but from the Islamic point of view, uh, it, probably it has to do with, in Turkey, the sorts of people that one meets, because the country is very much divided, even more so under Erdogan, between um, more religious and more secular people. And I think the secular people are more secular than ever because they feel that Erdogan has become an oppressor, rightly or wrongly, that's their feeling. And so that has frustrated them even more with Islam, and they've become more secular. But, I mean, if you go to, to most Islamic countries, whether it's Arab countries like Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or Indonesia, um, religiosity, I think it's fair to say, is, is on the rise. Now, it's a bit tricky because people say, well, women are wearing the headscarf more often, but that doesn't mean just because they wear a headscarf that they're super pious. There could be social pressures that are leading them to do that, because if they don't, they'll stand out or whatever. So it is tricky to measure that, but just anecdotally from you know, my time in, in, in different Islamic countries, no, I would say that religiosity among people is, is very strong, um, that people care about defending Islam. Um, you know, I gave a talk in Morocco um, recently, and uh, just from an academic point of view, it was not from a Christian point of view, I was just introducing some general academic ideas, um, but mainly from the Western secular perspective, and there was a pretty uh, aggressive response among some people in the audience, you're undermining Islam, you're trying to undermine our faith, you've come to this, so um, pe people can feel very strongly about religion in the Islamic world. Could you, uh, could you expand a little bit more about this idea of love and mercy and forgiveness in the Quran and, and in terms of virtue? It would seem to me that mercy lacks something that forgiveness has. That there's a distinct difference. I'm sorry, that... Uh, difference mercy. between mercy and forgiveness. And forgiveness, yeah. Tied in with this idea of, of love as a, as a value in the Quran. Right. Um, you know, um, both the Quran and the Hadith emphasize God's, God's mercy. Um, God's mercy is communicated, um, first of all, in um, nature itself, as we mentioned, but then in the prophets. Who, God didn't have to send prophets, but he chose to. But there's also a notion of God showing grace that in, in the Arabic word is lutf, that to individuals he sends certain graces to help them along the path to faith. So there's definitely, even if God is not called Father, there's definitely this notion of what we would call divine providence, which is very important. Um, but there's, at the same time, that just stands there side by side with language in the Quran about God's ghadab or wrath against unbelief. So, so God in the Quran has intense, it's probably not fair to say, emotions, but his disposition is distinct 
towards believers and unbelievers. Um, and it's generally understood that um, in Islamic tradition that mercy is supposed to be extended both to, to, to everyone around you. You know, there's a famous expression that, which is al, al, in Arabic, al-jar qabla al-dar, which means that your neighbor comes before your own house, and whoever doesn't have love um, for his neighbor cannot have love for God. Um, so, and if anyone's traveled in the Islamic world, I don't know anyone if this was your experience, but there's a very strong spirit of hospitality and generosity. Um, and so, uh, I think in the Islamic system of ethics, there is a strong notion of um, uh, of kindness and mercy towards the other. Um, in Islamic theology, however, it's a little more complicated because of the relationship between God and unbelievers, the prominence of divine punishment in the Quran renders things a little more complicated. Maybe. Yeah. Should we just do one or two more because it's getting late? Yes. So we know that there is a discrepancy within the... Sorry. Yeah. So there's a discrepancy within the um, idea of the deity of Jesus between the Quran and the Bible, right? And as far as I know, the Muslims claim that the reason that you cannot believe the Bible's um, version of it is because it's been corrupted over time. But we've established that the Quran that we know has been, I don't know, compiled in 1924, and we don't have the original manuscripts. So how does the Muslim community reason through this. Right, yeah, that's an important point. So, I mean, the, the real challenge in defending the, what we might call the authenticity of the Quran is, um, I think the last question is gonna come up here. Okay. One, one more up here. The, the real challenge in, um, in articulating the authenticity of the Quran from a Muslim perspective is the story of the collection of the Quran because this, the story is, whether or not the story is authentic is debated as well, but the story is that the Quran was compiled by the third leader after the Prophet Muhammad. So not the first one, not the second, but the third. His name was Uthman. And it's said that he compiled a version of the Quran and destroyed all other versions. Now, did he do that successfully? There's been a lot of ink spilled in Islamic tradition, treatises written in Arabic, defending that he did. Um, but that's an interesting question. Um, again, a Muslim would say, even if we don't have the manuscripts, we have this oral transmission. Now, critical scholarship would say, actually the manuscripts do matter because we find that Muslims recite the Quran in many different ways. It's known as qira'at or different readings. So the manuscripts do matter. Um, I would just say, sort of from an academic perspective, there are interesting textual questions for both, both books. We have lots of different manuscripts for the New Testament, and, and we have lots of different manuscripts for the Quran. The manuscripts for the Quran tend to be written in what we call a defective script, that is, they're missing vowels and some consonants. So there's lots of questions. So there's just a lot of work to do. That doesn't mean that Christians' faith needs to be challenged or Muslims' faith needs to be challenged, but textually, there's a lot of work on both uh, sides. Actually, I don't have any questions. I, uh... Uh, my name is Ahmed Saleh, I'm the principal of Anur Academy for Arabic and Islamic Studies here in, uh, based in Denver Islamic Society. I would like to thank you because uh, usually I, I would be in your place and get all these questions and uh, it's, it's really... <laughs> uh, so that was great, thank you so much for inviting us uh, and uh, we would love actually to see you uh, uh, even more in Denver. Uh, if I would ask any question, I would ask uh, what do you think uh, about these type of studies? Uh, and uh, how it is important to have these type of studies in the Middle East. Uh, I know it's, it's a lot here in America, maybe in the West, but uh, when we come to the uh, Islamic universities, uh, do you think it's something important to have this kind of relationship or uh, collaborative work between the West and uh, the Islamic countries when we talk about academia? Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you. Um, Right, I think it's a great challenge in the Islamic world and we, we shouldn't underestimate how many Muslim thinkers who are interested in critical scholarship and are, see nothing wrong with sort of bringing faith and reason together. Um, you know, I work for an organization called the International Quranic Studies Association. Our executive director is a Muslim named Namran al-Badawi. 
Our president um, next year is a Muslim named Abdullah Saeed from Australia. So um, there are many scholars working in the Western Academy who come from a, a Muslim perspective. Um, there are challenges with freedom of uh, expression, I think, in the Islamic world, honestly. Um, recently, a friend of mine named Mustafa Akil, who's a Turkish journalist, writes for the New York Times. I don't know if you heard this news, but he was arrested in Malaysia for giving a speech challenging um, Islamic, the, some of the traditional notions about apostasy in Islam. Uh, and then his book was banned um, after that incident. So um, there, there are challenges. I wonder if Muslims in the West have a particular role. I don't know if you have thoughts on this, but um, there are so many leading thinkers right now working, working in the West um, who have innovative ideas um, both in Europe and in North America. And now the world is so connected for, for social media and other ways that I think they're going to continue to play people like Hamza Yusuf at Zaytuna in California, but many, many others. Um, so I think that uh, you and your colleagues have an important role to play in that whole question. Thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds. And I do think that the Notre Dame Club needs to bring him back <laughs> again soon. Um, I, I just want to say that in Denver, we've had some really great experiences in the dialogue, um, interreligious dialogue. And it may have even been a year ago that we um, hosted the film A Sultan and the Saint about the Sultan of, of Egypt and St. Francis of Assisi, which was a beautiful discussion of, of two men sharing their faith. And one of the important things that we know is that Christians need to talk to Muslims and Muslims need to talk to Christians about our faith because there's a great opportunity for dialogue and for sharing. And I, I just want to express again our thanks to you. That was a brilliant presentation. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>